right this election has also told us that the citizen is only thing we used to do and i think i'm i'm a part of that is the only thing we used to think our duty is to vote it's much more than that between one vote and the other vote there's so much responsibility and I, rti is one very important one so you point that out very well i want to go from the funding itself you've seen the nexus whether it's corporates dealings or whether the political funding itself being very huge and we have only touched the tip of the iceberg and it's the scam the scams if we take these two words then we go into the other part of it the other part was the refereeing of it or the election commission itself the tools which we have it's a very robust system and i have often heard that india would go to other countries especially in africa even south america giving their expertise about how to run an election program right and it's amazing and massive to just look at it from outside looks like we there was a clear attempt to sabotage it if i could use the word from at every level whether it was from the registration level to the mobilization part to even the refereeing part which includes the cec etc would you spend a little bit of time to tell us what you think was the scale of this problem and tell us a little bit more because we have heard it but we have not completely thought through it one by one but if you could help us dissect it uh, it will be very useful for us and for the audience the public face of the referee as you uh, you know use the term is the election commission but that is again just the tip of the iceberg the electoral apparatus starts with the booth level officer at the bottom and goes all the way up to the chief elec uh, election commissioner sitting at nirvachan sadar all of them have their roles to play leadership of course is always provided by the uh, election commission sitting in nirvachan sadar but then at the state level the, re the leadership is provided by the chief electoral officers now starting with the law relating to the appointment of the election commission which came in thanks to another public interest litigation uh, suit that was filed and the supreme court gave a, a very progressive judgment uh, where they said that there must be an independent um, committee that would recommend uh, to the president the appointment of uh, election commissioners as of now three but it could be it, it can even be more because the constitution doesn't specify how many more you require but the government brought in a law to undermine the independence of that committee as well by making it a government dominated committee now that is where the appointment process gets mm -hmm. you know starts getting you know skewed and then um, further and further down you go or let us let us see let's start from the from from the ground level itself the appointments are happening at that level the, the, the decision to allow a citizen to vote or take that person away from the electoral list takes place at that ground level where the election commission has no direct control mm -hmm. they get inputs in terms of what has happened in terms of the electoral roll revision exercise but at the ground level where these booth level officers the local electoral registration officer or the assistant electoral registration officer they make their decisions that decide whether somebody can vote or not for example a former president of the jnu teachers association saw that her name was taken away from the electoral rolls and she realized that only on the day of polling a very prominent human rights advocate realized that her mother's name was no longer there on the on the rolls but there was a funnier situation in kerala there was a gentleman who went to the polling booth and discovered that his gender had been entered into the electoral roll as female so what did he do obviously they prevented him from voting at that point of time so he went back dressed up as a woman and came in to exercise his vote and after some argumentation he was able to exercise now this is the ridiculous levels to which the electoral uh, role revision exercise has descended into and why has it been allowed to become like that is something that people should be asking there are instances after instances reports after reports from various parts of the country where entire localities of people belonging to the minority community or some uh, other community have been uh, their names have been removed so they have been effectively disenfranchised or people have gone to the electo to the polling station and they've discovered somebody has already cast the vote in their name how did that happen so there are several of these problems that, and despite that we've got, got this mandate so these problems also exist so that that's that's something that really needs to be in one place yes. do you think these are orchestrated and there is good evidence for it in fact this is what civil society has been saying that a lot of this uh, 
looks like it has been orchestrated. For example, there have uh, been media reports which show that somebody's name which was already included in the voter rolls was objected to by somebody who was not even a part of that electoral rolls. He was somewhere else. And based on that objection, that person's name was removed without even giving that person a chance to defend why his name should be retained in that electoral role. This is one example that was reported. The ability of the media also to report on these cases, place after place after place, is, is also quite limited, but it's happening in every polling station. If there are 10.48 lakh polling stations across the country, according to the Election Commission's own um, you know, data, then just imagine how many people you will actually require to see what is happening in each of those booths. You need 10.48 lakh people at a minimum. Let me give my own example. I have not seen till date the face of my booth level officer in Delhi. But our roles, they are, and they are supposed to visit our houses. My house is never locked. Somebody or the other is always at home. But our voter roles have been revised. Thankfully, my uh, name and my family's name continue to remain on the electoral rolls. But we've never seen the booth level officer's uh, face. They have never visited us, even for distributing those slips to say this is your polling station where you have to go. This is the address where you have to go and vote. It just gets thrown into our you know, apartment complex somewhere and then we have to pick it up. So what is, you know, what is usually problematic is these ways in which the system is being compelled at the micro level at one minute to not function according to rules and regulations. And at the micro level, you have the referee sitting and making decisions in such a manner that really do not appear to be fair and balanced. For example, the kinds of complaints that went to the uh, election commission about speeches that should not have been made or that the person who made the speech should have been penalized for making such disruptive speeches, such divisive speeches and in, uh, you know, using religion as the basis or really using religious uh, markers uh, you know, during the electoral campaigning and we have seen very little action taken by the election commission on these kinds of things. And that is what puts uh, a huge question mark on the credibility of the electoral management body which is the Chunav Ayog. And to think that uh, if I am not mistaken the Election Commission of India continues to be the president of the worldwide body of electoral management bodies. Okay. And huh. occupying that kind of a position, you know, they have to show that they are an impartial referee. It is not enough to helicopter foreign observers from a select group of countries and then show that everything is fine here and not get them to interact with anybody from civil society. I am aware of instances where people in Maharashtra, civil society wanted to meet with those uh, foreign observers to say that look there are some of these problems but the uh, request for appointments was simply not granted. So what kind of an impartiality um, uh, uh, you know, process, impartial process are you, you know, following and what are they observing? Is it more like a, a tailored um, you know, walkthrough or uh, you know, we have these heritage walks in uh, various yeah, cities. Yeah, yeah. So, is that the kind of exercise that went through in uh, in this international observing business? So, these are all questions, you know, that people should now be asking. Like, um, I was um, reading another news item which said that there were, at one point of time, within two weeks of uh, the election schedule being announced, there were two lakh complaints filed from Kerala alone on the Sea wow. Vigil app. See, Vigil app that was the that the election commission has set up about the violation of the model code of conduct. What happened to and simply telling us that 93% of them have been sorted out, they have been resolved, doesn't tell us anything. Correct. You have to tell us in each case what was the complaint, whether it was found frivolous or whether it was found to be serious, and what action did you take? Correct. And did that action actually lead to change in behavior? Did it prevent any further occurrences of that kind of behavior? That's we don't get to know any of that. So on the one hand. We claim to be the mother of democracy, the largest democracy, no thanks to government, sheer numbers make us the largest democracy in the world, but the mother of democracy claim is something that the current establishment has made and uh, to be able to live up to that reputation, your praxis has to be, has to demonstrate it. That praxis demonstration unfortunately was not there during the, uh, uh, you know, during the last round of elections and that is the most unfortunate part. What is there to lose? If your commitment is to the constitution, as they kept saying all the time, if your commitment was to ensure that the electoral system would be conducted in an unimpeachable manner, then why were there so many gaps in all of these issues, in, in these areas? Uh, and the last point that I want to you know, point out, 
thousands of crores of rupees of uh, you know cash were uh, confiscated seized lakhs of liters of liquor were seized and just like in every other election in the past we will never get to know the outcome of all of these things in a holistic manner how many of the people who were purveying these materials were penalized how many of them were found to be uh, absolutely above the law you know they, they were doing everything lawfully but what i don't understand is when you have income tax uh, law amendments that actually discourage you from carrying around too much cash then why was there so much cash around what kind of monitoring was done with regard to the withdrawals it goes back to the earlier question that i was saying who is monitoring these large cash withdrawals is the rbi doing its business it's it's its job of looking at these things making a report who is reading this report within government are the law enforcement agencies like the ed cbi and all of them are they getting access to this and are they being as proactive as they were in the case of some opposition parties to probe these complaints of corruption so all of these are the questions that we should be asking eventually and the election commission actually has a duty to inform people about all of this the present chief election commissioner i think will go on in terms of his tenure until next year the two other commissioners have been appointed recently so they will have a fairly you know long tenure so they actually will be there there will be a certain measure of stability in the election commission in terms of leadership so they have a responsibility now to give answers to people about how they've conducted these elections above and beyond the form 20 that they might put in the public domain or the form 17 cs eventually that they may put in the public domain yeah. that's not enough that's they've got to do a lot more than this to tell people that look this is how we acted these are the actions that we took took on your complaints that's a minimum constitutional obligation that they should be performing thank you so much very very detailed in uh, i would also ask you to talk a little bit about the evm mm -hmm. and then i'll jump into some conclusions now evms became a major point of debate um prior to the elections and even during the elections i must confess and i must openly admit i have no way of proving that the electoral voting machines the, elect uh, the electronic voting machines are tamperable i have no evidence my simple question which is based on the rti interventions that i did which eventually compared the election commission to admit was the number of machines that were defective now that is hugely problematic for us okay like i'll i'll give you an example from the last elections and then i'll come to what happened during the most recent elections in 2019 at the time of first level check when these machines are pulled out of the strong room they are dusted they are cleaned up anything that might be remaining in terms of uh, materials or paper or whatever that was there from the previous elections all of those are removed and they are readied and their status in terms of functionality are checked at that point of time across the country the election commission uh, was given data by the engineers of the manufacturing companies which conduct this first level check that there were 85000 machines that had gone defective okay now it might look like okay it's a small amount it's less than 10% of the total the question is you know the, I, i would now now like to draw an analogy here that if you were to go to a uh, shop and buy a calculator and you found that the calculator was defective would you simply brush away by saying okay that company which manufactures the calculators manufactures thousands of machines it's okay one machine will go bad and very good yeah that yeah each electronic voting machine according to the election commission's own admission and information that i have obtained through the rti from the manufacturing companies each set of ballot unit control unit and EV and the vv pat unit the total combo costs between 33 to 35000 rupees who's paying that the election commissioners are not paying it from their pockets it is the tax paying voting citizen of india who's paying for their purchase so we have a right to know why are those machines going bad that was 2019 let's leave that aside uh during polling in 2019 when polling was actually in progress 13000 machines were found defective now let you uh, i would like to inform your viewers what is worrisome about this what is worrisome is this when these machines are manufactured they go through a mandatory audit by a government appointed agency called the standards testing and quality control directorate under the ministry of electronics and information technology only if they are tests and checks pass the machines can they be distributed to the constituencies through the districts they go to the strong rooms so they had gone through all of these systems 
they were found okay and they were sent to the constituencies but at the time of first level check so many thousands of machines went bad understood they have been they have been replaced or they they have been repaired and sent back we don't have information about whether they were actually replaced or they were repaired we don't know nevertheless at the time of candidate setting machines went bad the uttarakhand ceo in 2019 april less than 10 days before polling day writes to the election commission saying hundreds of machines are going bad in these these districts at the time of candidate setting please send us replacements and then the commission itself admits that more than 13,000 machines went bad on the day of poll. Why is this happening? Why are those machines not able to work? Even one machine not able to work is hugely problematic. Now let's come to the latest elections. I do not have data about how many machines, machines went bad across the country uh, in the 2024 elections. However, I had the opportunity of being a counting agent in one of the constituencies, assembly segments in Bengaluru. And we found a list that on polling day, in that one assembly constituency, which has about 270 polling stations, uh, close to 30 machines went bad. Ballot units went bad, control units went bad, VVPAT units went bad. When did they go bad? Some of them went bad, uh, a smaller number of them went bad when mock poll was conducted before the start of actual poll. A large proportion of this 30 or so went bad during actual polling. Okay, and they had to be replaced. Why is this happening? So, just because the electronic voting machine shows a certain candidate tally in the control unit at the time of counting and that number matches with the candidate wise number of slips printed by the VVPAT unit for me is not adequate for the purpose of giving 100% confidence in these machines. That's not enough. We need to know why these machines are going bad. Because this would not be acceptable with any other Correct. consumer good that we would buy off the yeah. shelf in the market. Yeah. Why is this being tolerated in this? Uh, and the VVPAT is a patented technology. It's, it's a patented machine. EVMs are patented machines. So if that and, and they match up to certain standards. So why is it that they're defective is a question that the election commission has simply never been able to answer. There are cutter errors. There are sensor errors. There are contrast errors. The ballot unit doesn't function. The control unit doesn't function. The earlier errors that I mentioned are all the VV patterners. Mm. So each one of these machine uh, components goes bad. Commission has a duty. The manufacturing companies have a duty to answer why is this happening to the people. So therefore, the result that eventually comes on counting day is something that cannot be taken. At least I, in my individual uh, in a capacity, I would say that I am not fully convinced. Wow. about these machines because you also have a problematic rule in the conduct of elections which is 49 MA that actually requires you to go through an elaborate procedure under threat of penalty including three months of imprisonment where if you say that a certain slip that was printed by the VVPAT did not match with the preference that you had indicated while pressing the ballot unit and then the next test uh, vote that has to be conducted according to the rules prints the correct candidate slip on the VVPAT machine, then you could be in trouble. Wow. Now that is a hugely discouraging factor. Absolutely. So how many people actually have, despite all the sweep exercises of public awareness raising that the election commission has conducted, actually have seen this happening? That yes, the EVM and the control unit and the VVPAT unit functioned according to the manner in which they were function, they are supposed to function, the slip did. Um, get printed the way I had indicated my preference and then it fell down. How many of them are able to? We need a survey across this country to actually ask these questions of people. What is it that they watched? I've had uh, anecdotal uh, instances of people telling us that yes, we saw the slip printed the candidate's uh, uh, name and the symbol and the number, but then the lights went off. We didn't see the slip get you know cut and fall down. When I heard this in 2019, I thought, oh my, these people probably didn't pay adequate attention. But today we have data that actually shows that a VVPAT machine is capable of incurring cutter errors. So the thing still, still hangs there and the lights go off. So, and that's one of the reasons why officially the data provided by the returning officer shows that so many machines were replaced because there were cutter errors. Why is all of this happening? Why is it that we are not able to get machines that will work 100% 
according to the way in which they should be functioning. I have data as recently as the November 2023 uh, elections that happened in five state assemblies. You would be surprised to know there isn't a single district where electronic voting machines, the ballot unit, control unit or the VVPAT unit functioned perfectly 100%. Not one. There will be five or ten ballot units that went defective somewhere. 15% VVPAT units went defective somewhere. In Mizoram, there are instances of 37% of the VVPAT units that were found defective during first level check in some district. 37%? More than one third? What is happening? Please tell us. Yeah. What, what really surprises me in this one is that if this process is there is ballot, okay, things have to move from one place to the other, quite a complicated process. Even if I if I see it as a person, I did work in risk management, if I see something is going wrong, the best way because this is a democracy, this is people voting, each vote is important. The best way would to go back and say these things happened. This is how I controlled it. These are the things I'm going to do in future. I have at least not seen the way you've discussed. I have not seen anything like this from the election commission. And that worries me. As they say in risk management, it's not the issue which worries. It's the not following the control and not being transparent of how to go path to green really worries, right? And and. Thank you so much for going in so much details. We've taken two or three parts, the funding part, the referee part with the commission and a very detailed technical process of EVM. But I wanted to take on one more part, is that you somehow if the voters are standing in one place and the government in the other, you're standing somewhere in between, taking something from here and telling them, can you knock knock, can you tell me more, right? There's always this imagination or maybe it's the uh, construct that, oh, government is corrupt. But in the recent past, there is also this feeling that they are biased. That has also seeped in. The corruption was only monetary. Now it seems to have had, a, if I could, for a lack of word, a saffron flavor to the idea of bias. But sometimes one feels that some people are not doing it, but they're, they're unable to give their will because the, it's impossible for everybody to rebel in every system. That's what some of the media friends have told, that many people who work in media, roughly they say they have to pay the EMI, they can't go against it, right? Mm -hmm. So they sit there. To, what is your take on the fact that, that the large government system we have, like so many people working even for the election, how much of it through your experience 20, 25 years, can we just work? just say everyone is corrupt or is it, is it the part of the system or is there a hope there even with the corruption and now with the idea of bias? How do you see that part? Well, I keep saying this in many of my officer training programs, something which, uh, you know, being a student of ancient history, I picked up in my readings of uh, the, um, uh, you know, the ancient Puranas. There is a belief that if uh, a king is able to rule in a just manner, then your rains will be good, your harvest will be good, and people will eat to their belly full. But if you have a corrupt king, a, uh, an oppressive king, then even the rains will fail. So I keep telling my officers that the reason why we are still able to, despite all the challenges that we have, that we are able to move ahead, uh, make progress. Uh, it may not be equal uh, you know progress for everybody but still there is progress we certainly are not in the same kind of situation as we were at the time of independence it's a large part of that contribution is because of the official dumb in this country they let's just take these elections i was quite surprised to see that on the website of the bihar chief electoral officer the unique identification numbers of every control unit, ballot unit and VVPAT unit that were checked and randomized and made ready for deployment during the polls, they were all put up on the website. So if anybody entertained any doubt as to whether this was actually the machine that was readied prior to poll, that was used during the poll and whose control unit and VVPAT after, you know, after that draw of lots was brought into the counting hall and counted those doubts would be dispelled. And that's exactly what I saw in this one assembly constituency to which I went as a counting agent, where the control unit unique ID numbers were all pasted on a cardboard and put in front of each counting table. Now that's the level of transparency that is possible if the person in charge and the officials working under him or her are committed to doing everything according to the law. But what would you do with a set of people 
who would deny the right of a, in, a citizen to contest elections by simply not telling the person that okay you have not taken the oath of the constitution while filing the nomination papers come here and i will administer the oath to you it's almost like okay no no, no you are a candidate it's your responsibility to take the oath not mine to remind you that you haven't taken now that is not the kind of you know officials that we want manning the system you have to govern in a manner that every person matters and that philosophy should be there right from the top it can't just be a jumla it can't just be a slogan that okay we will provide last mile connectivity for us the person sitting at this you know standing at the very end of the last mile ease of concern the antio there etc etc all of those can't just be slogans your actions have to show that yes they are geared towards reaching to that person and making sure that that person gets justice or that person gets their entitlements which they should be getting okay so i will not for one moment say that the entire bureaucracy is corrupt nor will i for one moment say that the entire political um, establishment in the country is uh, not worth relying upon no but we do have rotten apples in every basket and that's the reason why we have law enforcement systems we have specific laws we have agencies that are tasked with removing these rotten apples from the basket but that function is not being performed to perfection and that is why we have these you know serious problems for example nominations being rejected uh, there has been a amazing report you know very minute and and uh, as as of now they seem to be uh, facts that were discovered in the course of a fact finding mission that in the gandhinagar constituency people were discouraged from being from going out and voting there are n number of uh, uh, media reports which actually uh, have pointed out that in specific segments dalits in specific segments minorities were threatened from going to the polling booth to cast their vote now if those kinds of things are happening it's not as if people will sit down quietly and you know take it lying down they do go to the law enforcement agencies to get redress but if those that law enforcement mechanism does not provide redress then people's faith in the system starts deteriorating that starts depleting so therefore i think and this is the first time i think i remember seeing in uh, you know in recent memory where civil society started writing to the chief electoral officers the returning officers the district electoral officers and everybody else saying that you have a duty to perform ah that's under the constitution under the electoral laws please you know perform those duties according to the law and what was interesting was that eventually the international congress also followed up with a similar letter okay. to the various electoral officials so it was literally like a you know um, um, uh, inspired by the you know civil society and I, and i thought that was a very interesting uh, you know development where this it was not so much as a strategy it was simply it was simply a step that was taken by civil society but it was adopted by one of the uh, the perhaps the largest uh, you know opposition party so there is still quite a lot of hope there and and it is it is that hope if we want to preserve that the uh, administrative systems the the referees and the biggest uh, referee of all the judiciary has to respect and has to deliver if those things don't happen then democracy becomes hollowed out and to ensure that the democracy doesn't get hollowed out and these systems work that is where you need vigilant citizen action if that doesn't happen these systems are not going to respond there is a simple saying in kannada that a mother will feed the baby only if it cries and draws her attention hmm. that's that that's a very successful way of putting it yeah. there are many mothers who know at what time to feed the kid that's a different thing but the saying is still there yeah. so what i'm pointing out is that again i you know what lord acton said eternal vigilance is the price of liberty today in addition to liberty eternal vigilance is the price of democracy and therefore people do have that responsibility to uh, to perform to ensure that our democracy functions the way our constitution has designed it yes. thank you so much i i just want to end with the fact that one of my theater activist friends and mere notes saying that evening i feel that i'm not alone i'm with a lot of people and that's making me sleep well today so i i think in the same way the way you put the hope out to people i would want to end this uh, very wonderful discussion to saying what do you want to say in terms of hope to the voters who have actually guided this election something to them what they should continue doing uh, because they've already shown the way 
but it is a voting exercise the next voting will come after 5 years absolutely what is the role we should all perform that vigilance part would can you just specify that with a sense of hope and that's how that well I well i i think uh, it's not just 5 years away uh, assembly elections are down the line later this year and there will be some more next year so it will continue to go on until and unless of course the agenda of one nation one election gets forced down our throats i think uh, vigilant citizenry we you know, how, you know a lot of people who were earlier not so closely involved in um, election watch you see election watch in this country simply didn't exist once upon a time and then thanks to the voters right to know the background of candidates election watch emerged as a phenomenon but focused primarily on the educational antecedents the criminal antecedents and the financial background of candidates now election watch has moved beyond that to look at the very process itself how is that functioning yes. i think that kind of you know maturation over the uh, you know election after election is something that really uh, can make our democracy very robust now that momentum momentum is something that i think uh, our citizenry as such should not lose should continue with we have the right kind of tools for doing it the right to information is definitely there but more than that anything related to elections you can get access to information except for what the voters choice was at the county at the polling booth all other records are required by law by the representation of people act and the conduct of election rules conduct of election rules they should be available for public inspection and anybody who wants to get copies of those documents should be given copies on payment of fees that's the election commission's responsibility so what people need to do is to get hold of all of these documents you know it is not just the final result sheet that people are entitled to or the form 17c which says how many people came and voted out of the total number of uh, voters in each polling booth there is so much more that gets reported to the election commission by the returning officer by the chief electoral officer by the general observer police observer the expenditure observers sector officers there are so there is so much of input that's going into the election commission so i think what uh, civil society mass media academics and private citizens need to do is start probing all of these things it costs only 10 rupees and if you are a person from below the poverty line you don't have to pay any fees at all to get this information oh. and it would still be of a matter of interest to you why because you might be below the poverty line but you're still a citizen of this country and you are a voter Correct. and you are still a taxpayer you may not be paying income tax but every time you buy a kilo of salt or clothes or a textbook or a notebook for your children going to school you become a taxpayer so it is your right to ask for this information so ask for these kinds of things sit and analyze it this is how representative democracy becomes participatory democracy we don't have to wait for government to create those spaces and these processes for people to participate in decision making or in seeking accountability people can do it themselves because there are spaces already available which are as of now rarely used in the legal system what we require is through you know outlets like uh, you know your like edina to reach out to the people and say hey look these are all your rights to find out and these are the places where you can actually go and demand accountability start using it because ultimately what i you know what we also say in our right to in, in our uh, training uh, programs on uh, human rights or fundamental rights or even the right to information we say you know fundamental rights or even the right to information they are like muscles the more you use them the more active they are the less you use them the more they will atrophy and then don't complain that my muscles are not working so it is your duty your responsibility exercise them and you will find a much better healthier uh, more progressive democracy tomorrow hey thank you so much thank you so much this is venkat uh, closing for edina from a wonderful discussion with venkatesh naik thank you so much for coming ಮತ್ತಷ್ಟು ವಿಶೇಷ ವಿಡಿಯೋಗಳನ್ನು ನೋಡಲು ಮತ್ತು ಹೊಸ ವಿಡಿಯೋಗಳ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ತಿಳಿಯಲು ಈ ದಿನ ಡಾಟ್ ಕಾಮ್ ಯೂಟ್ಯೂಬ್ ಚಾನೆಲ್ ಸಬ್ಸ್ಕ್ರೈಬ್